for his first State of the Union address tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. So what can we expect to hear? Joining me now, Mercedes Schlapp, White House Senior Advisor for Strategic Communications. Mercedes, good to see you this morning. Good to see you. I don't think there's enough hairspray to keep my hair down. <laughs> so I don't know. It's pretty windy over here I in D.C. Feel your pain. <laughs> a, a breezy Washington, D.C. morning. Uh, what is the president doing right now to prep for this, this big night? Well, the president has been very involved in drafting the State of the Union and making sure uh, that obviously you're going to see him speaking directly from the heart. Uh, th the president is going to be focusing on building a safe, strong, and proud America. He wants to address all Americans and talk about how we're going to be lifting up all Americans and ensuring that they have expanded opportunities, uh, economic opportunities, also investing in our American workers. I mean, this is going to be a very strong and powerful message where he wants to be forward looking, bipartisan, and calling Congress to take action on uh, so much of the priorities that the president is focusing on. He's also going to take the opportunity to talk about his accomplishments. Obviously, Obviously, last year was a very uh, historic year in terms of passing the tax cut law and the benefits that we've already seen in our economy from over 250 companies uh, providing bonuses or increasing their wages for their employees, having companies saying they're going to bring back uh, business to America. And as the president says, we're open for business. And so this is the renewed optimism that we have been looking for for so long in America, where it benefits all Americans. And that's going to be that message of hope and strength that we'll see coming out tonight from the State of the Union. We expect it to be a very big moment for this president and you and other members of the president's um, team have said he plans to unify particularly members of Congress there that are still so divided. How specifically can you tell, tell us that the president plans to do that tonight? Well, first of all, I want to say, the, you know, one of the biggest components always in the State of the Union is the gallery of guests. And what the president's going to hone in on is about the everyday American hero and what they're giving back to their communities. And those are the people that we work for. We work for the forgotten men and women. And so I think it's a reminder uh, to both Democrats and Republicans that this is not about politics or party. This is about the American agenda. And so who, the president is working for the American people. And what he's presenting in so many cases, and when you're talking about infrastructure and investing in our roads and bridges and in our, in our workers, when you're talking about immigration reform, he is reaching across the aisle. He was, wants to work with the Democrats to get the results done. And at the same time, he's going to talk about the fact that it's important that because of what he's pushed forward in terms of his economic vision right. for America, that of deregulation and job creation, that we're seeing the benefits. And we and we want to make sure that we deliver that message to the American And people. he'll be able to deliver that message, but not to some Democrats, Mercedes, who say they're just not going to show up. There's a lengthy list now, including Maxine Waters, a Democrat who says the president doesn't deserve her attention. Frederica Wilson, another rep, says that it, it would be an embarrassment for her to be seen there. John Lewis from Georgia, citing Trump's recent comments about Haiti and other African nations. Barbara Lee, I mean, the, we've got pictures up of these Democrats who are planning to boycott the president's first state of the union address. What does the president think about that? Well, we call that political theater. Uh, it's political stunts by uh, these congressmen who obviously want to have a sound bite in the media uh, because what the president is focused on is about that you know, s single mom in middle America or that hardworking uh, construction worker who uh, is now going to get a pay check increase and be able to save for the chi their child's uh, education. I mean, this is about real stories. This is about talking about the progress we're making in America. This is about defending our homeland and national security, rebuilding America, rebuilding our military, yeah. which, as we know, should be a I, very much of a bipartisan and issue. And you think they would at least want to show up, right? Um, so I have to move on to a couple other things. I, I know it's a busy morning for you, but Andrew McCabe is out, that making huge news yesterday. And then we later saw a video of uh, the DOJ's Rod Rosenstein and Christopher Wray from the FBI leaving the White House after the announcement of Andrew McCabe's departure from the FBI was made public. What were they doing at the White House? Well, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of that, of that in particular, what happened in that meeting. What I can tell you is that the president was not involved in the decision-making process of McCabe. This was something uh, that you, I would refer you to the FBI. So the president, what was his reaction then when he did find out if he was not involved in 
and, and his removal from the FBI. What, what did he think when he found that out? Well, again, the president has full confidence in his FBI director, Christopher Wray. He's a man of integrity. As we know, the president has been vocal and been concerned about political interference of some in the FBI uh, who have uh, made certain, uh, certain uh, announcements and, and made certain suggestions. So, again, they, there has been concern about the political interference. When it comes to McCabe, that obviously was a decision made by the FBI. And Mercedes, lastly, um, the House committee last night uh, had a debate and a vote. Uh, they decided to release and make public this very controversial memo. It now sits on the president's desk. Does he intend to make that memo public? Well, the president's consulting with his national security team, with his legal team, uh, to decide the next steps and the next course of action. Do you know any which way he's leaning on that? Again, the, you know, the president has been consulting with his team. He has five days to make the decision. You know, as we know, the president uh, wants transparency. He's been concerned with the abuses of FISA and what it has done in terms of infringing in the civil liberties of our law-abiding citizens. So again, it, you know, the president has five days to make this decision. A huge day for you, the president, and the White House in this country. Mercedes Schlapp, we thank you for your time this morning. Thank you so and much. And we'll all be watching tonight. Thank you. As we await a decision on that answer, Trey Gowdy says the Democrats have been stonewalling this operation. My Democrat colleagues didn't want us to find this information. They, they did everything they could to keep us from finding this information. It'll be embarrassing to Adam Schiff once people realize the extent to which he went to keep them from learning any of this. So what is in it? And will you be able to see it? House Intel Committee member Brad Wenstrup, he has seen it. He voted in favor to make it public. He will explain his decision next live. Today, this committee voted to put the president's personal interest, perhaps their own political interest, above the national interest uh, in denying themselves even the ability to hear from the department and the FBI. When you have a deeply flawed person in the Oval Office, that flaw can infect the whole of government, and it today, uh, tragically, it infected our committee. So the House Intelligence Committee's ranking Democrat, Adam Schiff, there, slamming the panel's vote last night to release a classified memo to the public, which reportedly details surveillance abuses by the FBI. Ohio Republican Brad Wenstrup, member of that committee with me now, and sir, good morning to you, and thanks for coming back here. You bet. Um, what's in the memo? Well, let's, let's start with uh, process. First of all, you just played a clip from uh, Mr. Schiff. And the fact of the matter is that the FBI director, Ray, has seen the memo before we had the vote. We also had two people from the FBI go through it, one an analyst and the other one that's very familiar with the FISA court. The memo is about the FISA court process. It's a process that you can look up. It's, it's free information to see how the process should carry out. We put forth a memo because we thought it was time for the American people and at least our colleagues to start with to see what what has been going on in the government. You know, we are the representatives of the people. Do, do you think, um, Congressman, that this program has been abused? Well, I think that we certainly have some eye-raising things that we have seen take place. I think that the process has not been carried out to the intent that it was supposed to. And I think that it's, it's made for some bad decisions along the way. Sometimes there, there may be the possibility of information that's been withheld as the process goes forward. And so this is what we want to clarify. We want the American people to have eyes on this so that they have some idea of what we've been dealing with. And I will say this, Bill, we voted unanimously, although the Democrats voted against us releasing this memo to our colleagues, we voted unanimously to let their memo go to our colleagues. We are trying to be fair, professional, informative, transparent, and get to the truth. Now, do you think once the memo goes public, assuming that it does, right, you voted in favor, let's see what the White House does with it, does this clarify the Russia matter? Or does it further cloud all matters, Russia? I don't think it clarifies it completely. I think it's just one component of it, and it has to do with the court process, and that's one of the things we want to want to bring forward. We will continue with our investigation on all other matters, but this is an important component as to how things took place, how accusations were ultimately made, and the process taken by FBI and DOJ, who, by the way, ignored subpoenas and have stonewalled us every 
every step of the way. So having them engaged in the process, even though we did get the FBI involved, is a little bit tricky because they're the ones we're talking about and they're the ones that have made it more difficult for us to conduct our investigation. Adam Schiff called it a very sad day. Adam Schiff said you have a deeply flawed person in the Oval Office and that can infect the whole of government. Justice Department official warning Devin Nunes, the chair of that committee, that it would be, quote, extraordinarily reckless to make this public. Mm -hmm. How do you react on that front, N knowing the position as such 180 degrees away from the case that you're making? Well, I think uh, they may not, not, have not necessarily seen the memo, and also I think that it's it, disingenuous or wrong to be making these personal attacks when we're talking about putting facts in front of the American people. But they're saying it's reckless. Do you think it's reckless or not? I don't think it's reckless whatsoever. Mm -hmm. how, how will our minds change? when we well, see the summer. I think, I think it'll give you an opportunity, as, especially where you sit, Bill, as you watch these things and talk about them, to see what the process should be like and what the process that was that actually took place. And you can form your own opinion, and I have a feeling uh, the opinion you will form will agree with where I am. Mm. I'm assuming you expect the president to make this public. That's later in the week? He I has can't a five-day deadline. What do you right, think he does? I can't speak for the president, but I can tell you that we have followed all the rules in this process, and at the same time, we're allowing the Democrats to do the same thing and follow the same rules that we did. Yeah. Sir, thank you for your time as the My Republican pleasure. from Ohio, Brad Wenstrup. We will see in time. Thank you, sir, for sharing that with us today. Thank you, Bill. Strong new reaction out of the Pentagon after a California teacher insulted the brave men and women who serve in our military. The data is in. We don't have a good military. Think about it. The people who you know are over there. Your f stupid Uncle Louie or whatever. They're dumb. The state of immigration. Martha gets powerful reaction from an angel mom. Then, right before the major speech, Tucker's experts have all damn people that intellectual people. They're the f lowest stuff I know. So the Defense Department now firing back at that Southern California high school teacher recorded insulting the intelligence of our military members and comparing recruiters to pimps. Pentagon's director of outreach calling the comments, quote, very uninformed and not an accurate picture of those who are serving and why they serve. School officials saying they are now investigating those remarks. Breaking news from the U.S. Border Patrol. Two young men arrested near the U.S.-Mexico border, both with DACA status here in the United States, both accused of human smuggling. Jonathan Hunt is live in Los Angeles for us this morning. Jonathan, what does Border Patrol think these men were up to? Well, Sandra, we've got two separate cases that we're looking at here, one east of San Diego, close to the border, one north of San Diego on the coast. Now, in the first case, in the border area east of San Diego, Border Patrol agents arrested two illegal aliens and, in the process, noticed two suspicious vehicles. They pulled over one of those vehicles, and the 22-year-old driver admitted he was working as a scout for a human smuggling crew, working with another driver to relay information about Border Patrol movements. Under DACA, this being involved in a human smuggling event is a violation, and so they'll be held in removal proceedings in DHS custody and then ultimately removed from the country. And agents also discovered, Sandra, that this was far from the first time that man had successfully participated in human smuggling operations. So they've got him on several charges, Sandra. And Jonathan, the other incident? Well, this was the one along the coast, about 30 miles north of the border. It happened as a result of a tip from a citizen who saw a smuggling operation near Torrey Pines State Beach. Agents moved in on a vehicle to conduct an immigration check. They found three men inside, among them the driver, who is a 20-year-old DACA recipient. Immigration attorneys argue, though, that these are isolated cases. DACA recipients? are usually 99% of the cases the ideal immigrants. So it's not that these events are impossible, it's that they don't make sense as presented and it seems more inflammatory than it needs to be. 
And we should point out that these are indeed just two DACA-related arrests amid some 700,000 DACA recipients in the country. But clearly worth noting today, with President Trump preparing for his State of the Union, that will no doubt, Sandra, have a lot to say about immigration, DACA, and any possible path to citizenship. Sandra? I think you can count on that. Jonathan Hunt, thank you. Busy day on the Hill now, ahead of the State of the Union address. In moments now, we'll see uh, House Republicans hold their weekly news conference. Right now, leaders are calling for that surveillance memo to be released to the public to, quote, let it all out there. So we'll see what they say about that in moments. As our live team coverage leading up to tonight's primetime speech continues, and Fox News Sunday host Chris Wallace. Left-hand side of your screen at this hour, we expect them to address both the speech and that controversial Obama surveillance memo. It is on the president's desk. Will it be released to the public? Welcome to a brand new hour of America's Newsroom. I'm Sandra Smith. A big day, Bill Hammer. Big day, a lot of headlines, too. I'm Bill Hammer. Good morning, everybody. The president addressing a joint session of Congress, shining a spotlight on his first year in office and offering to work with Democrats in the year ahead. White House Communications Advisor Mercedes Schlapp giving a a preview about 30 minutes ago right here on America's newsroom. The president is going to be focusing on building a safe, strong, and proud America. He wants to address all Americans and talk about how we're going to be lifting up all Americans and ensuring that they have expanded opportunities. He wants to be forward-looking, bipartisan, and calling Congress to take action on uh, so much of the priorities that the president is focusing on. So now Team Fox coverage, Chris Wallace standing by in D.C. But first, John Roberts from the North Lawn at the White House and what he's picking up so far today. John, good morning. Bill, good morning to you. The president and his staff putting the finishing touches on the State of the Union. The president did a run-through yesterday in the map room of the full speech with teleprompter, getting ready for the big moment tonight. He'll, he'll start off by listing uh, his accomplishments uh, in his first year, uh, tax and regulatory reform, uh, first and foremost among them. The president believing that he's laying the groundwork uh, for a playing field on which American businesses can thrive. Of course, there, there likely may not be much mention of the big uh, legislative failure of last year, which was the failure to repeal and replace Obamacare, but the president still holding that in reserve uh, for 2018 or beyond. The first uh, year of his presidency was really all about getting some of the tougher legislation through legislation that could be considered to be partisan. Now the second year agenda is going to look toward uh, bigger picture items that uh, he can attract a fair amount of bipartisanship, the president is hoping. And on his laundry list are uh, furthering uh, the creation of jobs, growing the economy, a big infrastructure package, immigration, trade, and national security. On infrastructure, which is the big area that the president believes he can get some bipartisan support on, the White House is touting a plan that somewhere between one point, uh, when between one trillion and one point eight trillion dollars, depending on who you listen to, the president said. Uh, the other day, $1.7 trillion. And Republicans up in Congress are, are thinking that, you know, you probably have to break this into a number of different pieces. You can't do it all at once. Maybe do roads and bridges in one, do FAA and something, uh, some other items in another one. Uh, the Democrats, though, already critical of the president's efforts to, uh, to rebuild America's infrastructure. Chuck Schumer in an op-ed in the Washington Post saying, quote, the president promised a trillion dollar investment in our infrastructure on the campaign trail. But since he took the oath of office, Congress hasn't heard much about his plan. And what we have heard isn't promising. Democrats will watch the State of the Union, hoping that President Trump will change course by emphasizing the need for a major direct federal investment in infrastructure. What we understand so far is that it's probably going to be something along the lines of a public-private partnership to rebuild roads and bridges at the very least. The White House, though, and the press secretary, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, predicting a big night tonight. Listen here. The president, when he makes big addresses, he's yet to have a big moment that hasn't gone well. This is a person who rises to the occasion. I think you're going to see a lot of that tonight. Again, he has a great story to tell. Uh, there have been a lot of things that the media has tried to distract from the successes of the president. But tonight, this is his stage and his time to talk directly to the American people. And I think you're going to see a lot of the president himself come through in his words at the State of the Union tonight. You know, historically, presidents in the past have used the State of the Union as sort of a booster rocket for their agenda for the year. The president, in his address to Congress last year, was an official State of the Union, was basking in the afterglow and seemed to get some momentum for about a day 
and then Jeff Sessions recused himself from the Russia investigation. So, uh, Bill and Sandra, what remains to be seen, can the president use this to create some momentum, or is the next shoe going to drop in the Russia investigation or something else that will take this off the front page? Well, thank you, John. We continue to watch. <laughs> John Roberts from the North Lawn. Let's see if Chris Wallace can answer that question. He anchors Fox News Sunday. He joins us now. Hey, Chris, good morning. Good morning to you, Sandra. So a uh, big evening tonight, and, and John Roberts brings up a very good point. While we've had the White House this morning setting up high expectations for the first State of the Union address from this president, that is a big question, whether or not that momentum can carry on. I mean, all of a sudden, it's going to be all about immigration and funding the government and nine days away from another deadline. If this is a spectacular evening, does that, does that carry over? Well, look, I don't have any doubt the president is going to do very well tonight. He does well in these big speeches. He did well, if you remember last year, it wasn't officially a State of the Union, but it was a speech to a joint session of Congress last February. Uh, a lot of people, including me, thought it was uh, terrific. Uh, he's given a lot of other speeches on Afghanistan, the Davos speech, a variety of others that have been great. But oftentimes, he, he steps on his own story. He gets into a controversy. He reacted very badly last year when Jeff Sessions felt he had no choice but to recuse himself. And a lot of the momentum from the speech disappeared. And, and so to me, it's less a question of how he does tonight is how he does tomorrow and Thursday and you know can he can he continue the momentum uh, infrastructure is a good example uh, the president is talking about a trillion and a half dollar infrastructure program but a lot of the money that Democrats were counting on for that went uh, to pay for the tax cuts and as a result he's talking really about only 200 billion dollars only in Washington would you say only 200 billion dollars uh, to try to leverage into about a billion uh, about a trillion dollars in state local uh, and private money and what's interesting about this is that generally speaking without getting too far into the weeds mm -hmm. it's an 80 20 split it's 80 percent federal money 20 percent local money the White House is talking about a 20 80 split 20% federal money, 80% local or private money. That's going to be hard for a lot of localities to be able to afford. So can the president deliver this unifying message that the White House is, is setting this up to be? Well, he can deliver a message, but let's take a, another example, immigration. Uh, I'm sure he's going to talk about the fact that he wants, and he has made a huge concession by saying that he wants to give 1.8 million people, either DREAMers or people eligible for DREAMer protection who haven't signed up, to give them a pathway to citizenship. There are a lot of hardline conservatives on immigration issues uh, who are very upset about that. It gives them heartburn. On the other hand, he's demanding a lot in return, and the Democrats say too much in return. So he can deliver what he says is a unifying message, but whether it's actually going to unify Republicans and Democrats to be able to get a deal right. is very much to be determined. What do you make of this growing list of Democrats who say they're going to sit this one out? Uh, I mean, when I say growing, we've had to update the graphics because um, Frederico Wilson, Maxine Waters, John Lewis, Barbara Lee, Gregory Meeks from New York, a uh, bunch from Illinois, Bobby Rush, Danny Davis, uh, all say they will not be attending. Some of them say Maxine Waters, this president doesn't deserve her attention. Some saying they would be embarrassed to be there. What do you make of that? Well, look, they certainly have the right to do it. I'm sure some Republicans boycotted Barack Obama when he spoke. I personally think it's a mistake. I think that to a certain degree, you go to the State of the Union speech not to honor the particular president, but to honor the institution of the presidency, to at least hear what the man has to say. Uh, I suspect that he and the, and the f full, uh, you know, standing room only crowd in the House will proceed just fine without them. That's their decision, and I guess as we say, it's a free country. I expect we'll see a bit of you tonight, Chris Wallace, for State of the Union coverage. Into the wee hours of the night, I'm sure. I love it. I gotta say, you know, I've been doing this since 1981 with Ronald Reagan, and you know, sometimes the speeches don't last very long in terms of their their impact. But there is a kind of pomp and a circumstance for the president coming down the aisle and being greeted, and the diplomatic corps is there, and the and the the chief, joint chiefs of staff and the cabinet, yep. and some member some members of the Supreme Court. It, it you know, it's. The whole government is there, and uh, regardless of whether you like the president or not, it's a, it's a 
one of the things we celebrate in this democracy. It's a patriotic moment for sure. Chris Wallace, we'll see you tonight. Thanks for being Thank on you. this morning. It is now in the president's hand is to declassify this FISA member of the House Intelligence Committee voted last night along party lines to make it public. Mr. Trump has five days to review it and then make a decision. Again, this is a surveillance abuse memo by the Obama era FBI and Justice Department. Trey Gowdy says it looks like the president will go forward and make it public this week. The indications are that he's not going to exercise that. Um, and I would just tell my fellow citizens, if you're interested in whether or not the dossier was used in court proceedings and you're interested in whether or not it was funded by, by a political opponent, then, uh, then you'll want to see the memo. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Harris live in Washington on what we know today. Catherine, good morning. Well, thank you, Bill, and good morning. The committee's Republican chairman and the ranking Democrat met behind closed doors for about five hours yesterday about the memo, the Democrats' version will now be available to all House members to review, but it will not be released at the same time as the Republican version. A transcript of the committee meeting should be available as early as today, and that will allow folks to make a judgment on claims by the ranking Democrat that communication between members has broken down. I think we have uh, crossed a, a deeply regrettable line in this committee where for the first time in the 10 years or so that I've been on the committee, uh, there was a vote to politicize the declassification process of intelligence uh, and potentially compromise uh, sources and methods. Democrats also claim the Republican oversight investigation into the FBI and Justice Departments during the 2016 campaign was news to them. But back in December, December, you'll remember the Republican chairman, Devin Nunez, told Fox the investigation began about eight months ago and had already found damaging evidence of government surveillance violations. Well, we have had, a, had an ongoing investigation into DOJ and FBI since midsummer uh, for both FISA abuse uh, and other matters uh, that we can't get into too much. Committee members are not discussing the memo's contents, but Fox News understands that it does cover the identification of American citizens who were swept up in foreign intelligence gathering operations. This is known as unmasking, as well as the Trump dossier, and to what extent it was used to secure surveillance warrants through the National Security Court or the FISA Court. The New York Times reports that a surveillance warrant for a campaign aide, a policy advisor, Carter Page, was extended to mid in mid-2017 by the Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein. For some important context here, the removal of the Deputy FBI Director nearly takes us to a half dozen senior FBI executives who are part of Comey's inner circle who are now removed, retired, demoted, or reassigned, Bill. Wow, it's a lot. Kevin Harris, thank you. You're welcome. Live there in Washington. The Republican leaders are holding their uh, their weekly news conference, I should say, right now. You can see Speaker of the House Paul Ryan. Obviously, this is a big day for Republicans with the State of the Union address coming up. Let's listen. CRs is because of these filibusters of these vital appropriation bills. So, <clears throat> as we saw last week in Paul's district, the consequences are very real. Our men and women in uniform they depend upon these resources to keep themselves safe and to keep us safe. Um, so I urge. Uh, the Senate Democrats do the right thing. Drop the filibuster, process the legislation. Uh, we want to find a DACA solution. We will find a DACA solution. So don't hold up our military funding hostage for this. Let's move forward. Um, on a positive note, um, I'm excited to hear President Trump's State of the Union address tonight. And honestly, the State of the Union is looking up. It's really encouraging to be able to uh, come and hear an upbeat tone at a State of the Union. Uh, this will be my 20th of these that I've sat in. And I've got to tell you, uh, to be able to hear a State of the Union as bright as it is right now is something that's very encouraging. Wages are rising. Economic confidence is coming back to America. Tax reform is now the law of the land, and it is playing a huge role in this transformation. As, as Steve just mentioned, just yesterday, we heard from another major employer about investing another $50 billion into this economy because of tax reform. Just a couple of weeks from now, 90% of American workers, 90% of American wage owners, earners are going to see their paychecks get bigger as the IRS new withholding tables are put into effect in February. This is a big deal. Look, Jana and I were working the concession stand at our parish on Sunday uh, for our kids' basketball games, and a friend of mine who works at the Home Depot in Janesville could not wait to come up and tell me about the bonus that he had gotten, about the wage increase that he had gotten, what it's going to do for his life. You know, wherever you go, you have people coming up to you saying, you know, this is a new car payment for me. This is working. And what those of us who've worked on this issue for so many years, 
thought and suspected was if we do tax reform in America the right way, it will unlock a lot of...